Every bodybuilder is unique. That is why, in order to be a master bodybuilder, you have to learn the art of instinctive training. You have to know exactly how to finally arrange your routines and methods to bring out the best that's in you. And you can only do that if you understand all the Weeder principles. They've been created to take you from the beginning stages to the intermediate stages and to the advanced stages of training. Carefully, avoiding injury and avoiding pain. By mastering these techniques, these principles, you will become a master bodybuilder, know exactly what to do, exactly when to apply it in order to get the most out of your training. The Weeder system is really a compilation of all of the different factors that take place in a gym for exercise that affects the body. And these different principles compiled are sort of the indexing of how to systematically approach the principles involved in weight training. When you first start bodybuilding training, all you have to do is stick to the basics and you'll get plenty of results. But the more advanced your physique becomes, the harder it is to see any further progress. This is called the law of diminishing returns. So, if you're already working as hard as you can, simply trying harder isn't going to get you anywhere. This approach only leads to overtraining and potential injury. Instead, you need to train more effectively to figure out ways of getting more results from the same amount of effort. You need to learn to employ as many advanced training principles as possible. Inventors are always trying to come up with new exercise devices that will increase the response of the body to exercise. However, what has allowed modern bodybuilders to develop such fantastic physiques in the past several decades is the realization that the real advances are to be found in the software. That is, exercise technique rather than the hardware. These advanced training techniques, the best examples of which are Joe Weider's intensity training principles, operate like a super efficient computer program, which stimulates the maximum response possible from the muscles of the human body. In tape two, we dealt with the variety of basic bodybuilding techniques, including how progressive resistance training really works, how to organize your workouts into reps and sets, how to use variations of the split system to increase training intensity, why free weights should form the basis of your bodybuilding training, as well as a variety of other specific training principles designed to help you get the most out of your bodybuilding workouts. In tape seven, we explain the basic principles involved in training for mass and power, such as the need to train with heavy weights, how long to rest between sets, what exercises to use to develop maximum size and strength, how to generate power using compensatory acceleration training, and how to cycle your workouts to gain maximum development with the minimum risk of injury. In this tape, we will be examining a variety of basic, intermediate, and advanced weeder intensity training principles. Some of these principles involve basic muscle function and should become a part of every one of your workouts. Others involve training techniques that you'll find you use only occasionally in your overall training program. But as the law of diminishing returns teaches us, if you keep doing the same thing in your workouts day after day, week after week, without sufficient variety in your training program, without finding ways to increase the intensity of your training so that you force your muscles to respond, you'll begin to get less and less results from the time you spend in the gym. You can only increase training intensity so far by lifting heavier or doing more sets and reps. At that point, something more is necessary in order to get the kind of muscular development for which you're working so hard. That's when you need the Weeder Intensity Training Principles, the most effective set of training guidelines ever devised, which you'll find described in this tape. Full 
range of motion involves training a muscle from a position of full extension continuously through to a position of full peak contraction and back again. With certain exceptions, such as power training, for example, this is how to ensure the fullest possible development of the entire muscle. The principle behind isolation training is that you are working different elements in different areas of the body and you want to work them as efficiently as possible. The isolation type movements are movements that tend to affect the muscle directly without a secondary muscle involved. In other words, when you're doing a pressing movement with the chest, the primary movement is going to go to the chest, but you're going to have a secondary movement involved with the tricep and also with the deltoid. Now, an isolation movement for the chest would be one that brings the arm across the body, a squeezing type of movement where you are taking out the secondary type of movements. What we need to do is combine routines that are made up of compound and isolation type of movements to get the full benefit. You achieve continuous tension by feeling the resistance of the weight continuously and smoothly throughout the entire range of motion during the negative as well as the positive part of the repetition, lifting and lowering the weight without jerking or dropping it or using inertia to help you swing it up. When you're training, for example, if you're doing um, bent over rows, throughout the movement, you keep the tension on that body part so you never really lock out because a lot of times when you lock out you know you can stay in that position for quite some time there's no pain there so what you want to do is, is keep the tension on that body part The point of peak contraction in a repetition is when you are at full contraction in an exercise and then make a special effort to crunch and flex the muscle, holding it in this position for a moment to achieve as full and intense a contraction as possible. The peak contraction technique is most useful in doing one joint isolation exercises, such as triceps extensions, biceps curls, and leg extensions. Negative repetitions are when you lower the weight at a controlled movement. Um, you don't just bounce the weight or jerk the weight. The movement down is just as important as the movement up. You're hitting the muscle both ways. So say, for example, you see a lot of guys bench pressing. They just bounce the weight and jerk it back up. Always keep it smooth. That downward motion is just as important as pushing it up. It's just as important because it stresses strength and in a muscular definition in the muscle. Training to failure isn't the same as training to complete exhaustion. It simply means doing as many reps with a particular weight as you can until you're too tired to continue with any more reps with that weight without stopping to give the muscles involved time to recuperate. Eclectic is a word meaning to borrow from diverse sources. The eclectic principle teaches that to develop a complete bodybuilding physique, you need to use a variety of different approaches to training. Heavy training and quality training. Workouts for mass and for detail. Two joint power exercises. And one joint isolation movement. Priority training involves attacking your weaknesses by training weaker body parts on a priority basis. You do this by training your weaker body parts at the beginning of your workout cycle, when they are fresh and strong, at the beginning of your daily workouts, and of course, by increasing intensity using a variety of other weeder training principles. 
I suggest if you have a weakness that you try the Joe Weider priority training principle. If you have weak calves and when you go into the gym and it's, you know, calf day, start with calves. You know, train them first, blast them. Start with your weak body part. That's the only way it's going to get better. If you start with shoulders or back or whatever, um, by the time you get to your calves, you're not going to probably put as much into them as you would have if you would have started with them. If we had a chain and every link can hold a thousand pounds, but one link can only hold one pound, what is the strength of the chain? One pound. It breaks at the weak link. So you want to work that weak link or that weak body part first, or at least at the beginning of the workout, so you won't negate it and let it fly by. When you first begin working out with weights, it makes sense to follow a basic standard program of training until you see how your individual body responds to bodybuilding workouts. But everyone has strong and weak points in their physical makeup. There never has been, and probably never will be, a champion with an absolutely perfect physique. Some individuals will notice that they've inherited genetic weaknesses. Perhaps certain muscle bellies are too short to be developed easily, or particular muscles are naturally more developed than others. Or as you continue to work out, you'll find that some body parts respond and grow easily, but others seem to resist getting bigger and stronger no matter what you do. In either case, when a weak point develops, you have to make some adjustments to your training, or else your strong points will get stronger and weak points weaker, and you'll never develop that balanced physique you're striving for. To avoid this, it makes sense to train the muscles on a priority key basis to attack your weaknesses. How is this done? First, you need to train weaker body parts at the beginning of the training cycle when you're the most rested. And you need to train them at the beginning of the daily workout, again, when you're at your strongest. Another way of increasing the response of muscles to training is by giving them unfamiliar movements to do, or forcing them to perform movements in unfamiliar ways. When a muscle gets used to a certain exercise, it tends to respond less than when it's given a new and unfamiliar movement to do. This is why a complete bodybuilding routine involves doing a variety of different exercises for each body part. Changing the angles at which the muscles are worked and using many different intensity principles to force the body to respond in new and unaccustomed ways. So what we do is we operate in, in a muscle confusion principle really takes into consideration a lot of the other principles in that you are mixing things up. You're doing low repetitions, high repetitions, uh, giant sets, supersets, all these different principles that are just different from, from each, from one time to the next. And the muscle kind of shakes its head and acts as they're kind of confused. I'm confused when then I'm muscles. <laughs> I do use the muscle confusion principle um, in a way that I may walk into the gym one day and not really know exactly the exercises I'll be doing that day, but to confuse myself, I'll try something a little different. Instead of, like the free weights, I'll, be, I'll use maybe a machine instead, and it feels different, or go to a, a different gym and do a different exercise also in that way. It just feels different on the body and a different shock. The only secret I do is I mix it up. And people that look the same and stay the same, it's largely because they have a few favorite exercises and they don't want to change it and they don't want to listen to anyone and they don't want to try anything new. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that for me, trying things new, training in different gyms, training with different partners, uh, wearing different kind of clothing just to keep things interesting for me, uh, keeps me coming back for more. And I think by hitting it from every angle with every kind of exercise uh, makes it interesting and, and it makes it fun, although it's work for me. Uh, the only secret really is variety. Flushing involves forcing as much blood into an area as possible to produce maximum growth. Flushing is really body part training. This is why bodybuilders train each body part individually. When you train forearms, for example, doing several different exercises for this body part alone, one after another, hitting both the flexors and extensors without working any other body parts until you've totally bombed and blasted your forearm muscles, you are using the flushing principle to pump these muscles as full of blood as possible to generate as much growth and development as you can.
I use the Weeder Cycle training method um, where uh, if I'm training my legs twice a week, I'll train them heavy the first time and then light the second time. This way I'm able to maintain the size that I have but shape what I have and, and make it more prettier. Uh, so the first day I would do my bulk exercises, which are the squat and the leg press. And on my lighter days, I would do my shape exercises like my leg extensions and lunges. The Weider Forced Rep principle allows you to do more repetitions per set past the point of failure. For example, if we're doing the barbell curl, and we're doing about eight to 10 repetitions till you can't go anymore, but not resting, that's when you have your partner come in. And he'll give you that extra lift, not doing this, the exercise for you, but he'll give you the extra lift for a few more reps. And that's why they call it the forced rep. I myself consider this a very important part of bodybuilding. I notice I make my best gains when I do forced reps. I try to envision, you know, I don't put a mental block in my mind where I have a, a number where I say I, can, I have to stop there and I can't do any more. I get to 10, if I can't do any more, my training partner will come in, we'll bang on five more, my muscles will be throbbing, the blood will be going to the muscles. It's an, it's an incredible rush. I will ask for a, some help towards the last two weeks because I need to do that extra little bit. You know, I may not be able to do the 15 reps like I should. Um, and I'll need that help. Force stress is something you should work your way into, though. It's nothing I would jump into because a lot of people are not really familiar with, you know, the proper way of, of handling the weight and, and manipulating the weight up for you where, so you don't get hurt. It's very easily easy to get injured doing force reps. It's easy to tear a muscle. The weeder cheating principle involves using other muscles than the primary muscles you're training in an exercise. We're using techniques like inertia, swinging the weight up to handle the weight that's a little too heavy for you to lift strictly, or to continue to do more reps at the end of a set when you're starting to get fatigued. For example, if I was doing barbell curls and I was doing eight to 10 reps, and I wanted to get a few more extra reps, I'd possibly start swinging the weight to get the reps up. I would do the reps as uh, strictly as possible and then towards the end of the set where I could no longer do the reps in strict form, maybe then I'd use a little bit of a cheating technique just to get one or two more reps out past that point. When I start to feel the lactic acid in the muscle and feel the burning, I'll continue to push and do maybe three repetitions, cheating. So if you don't have a training partner there to assist you in getting the weight up, you cheat by maybe doing a little rock or a little movement to get that weight up. And also, you know, some exercises, you know, it's not practical for your training partner to use force reps. You know, if you're doing bent over rows, 300 pounds, it's not going to get underneath and, and uh, you know, give you force reps. So you're going to have to cheat a little bit by pulling with your lower back and your legs just to get one or two more reps out. But it's very effective and it's, it's kind of what you do when you don't have your training partner there. But I wouldn't use the cheating, for, you know, from rep one. Uh, I wouldn't do that. I believe in isolating the muscle as much as possible. Sometimes I like to do partial reps. For example, if I've done a couple of sets with full range motion, I'm really exhausted and I can't do a full range motion anymore. But I still can do, like, partial reps to exhaust every muscle fiber I got left. The Burns Principle is when you do a complete set, full range of motion, then doing partial repetitions, forcing more blood and oxygen into the muscle. Once more on each arm. That's it. I'll do a few, four short little burns, halfway up. That's it. That's it. Halfway up. That's it. Turn your wrist. That's it. Get the bicep up. Get that peak. That's it. Turn your little finger towards your shoulder. That's it. Once more with this arm, and you're all set. There.
I believe in the drop set system also. That's something where, say I was gonna use, say a 45 or 50 pound side lateral. I would do 10 reps with that movement, and as soon as I was done, I would go right to the 45s and do another, say, six reps or as many reps as I can do, and then go on to a lighter weight of, say, 40 or 35 and get as many reps as I can. So you're fully, like, getting every fiber of that muscle, you know, activated. You're just using a heavier weight. You can still get more activation of that muscle, but you can't do it because you're just not strong enough. So you go to the lighter weight and just keep going on and on. So you really just get that muscle blitzed. The Wheater Speed Principle, also known as Compensatory Acceleration, is an important power training technique discussed in greater detail in Tape 7. Compensatory acceleration involves accelerating a weight with an explosive movement rather than lifting it at a specific continuous speed. Explosive movements performed using free weights and relying primarily on two joint exercises recruit large amounts of white fiber and are ideal for the development of maximum mass and strength. One of the most valuable weeder principles is the pre-exhaustion principle. Basically, the concept behind this particular principle is an, to overload the muscle where one exercise would not necessarily take it to its full workload. What we're going to do is we're going to combine a single joint exercise along with a two-jointed exercise. For example, if you're working your chest, you would start with, let's say, a fly movement, which would only involve moving the weight across the body, and the only joint movement would be at the shoulder. Now, what that does is it saves the secondary muscles of the triceps and front deltoid, and they still have strength to go. So once you go to exhaustion on the fly, you'd move immediately to a set of, let's say, bench presses, and you would do these presses calling on the fresh secondary strength of the tricep and front deltoid and further exhaust the pec muscles. Now combining these two exercises together is going to give you a really effective overload and is a valuable principle in the whole realm of the weeder system. Sometimes I like to use um, pre-exhaust on uh, larger body parts. Um, for instance, uh, let's take legs. Um, you know, when, when you're doing squats, if you do squats first in your leg routine, um, you tend to really reach failure because um, your lower back's going to be giving way, uh, your lower back's going to be failing. Um, because basically, because it's the weakest link in your body when you're squatting, uh, it, your lower back's a lot weaker than your legs. So when you're squatting, your lower back's going to give way and you're going to have to stop before you've fully worked your legs. Uh, now, if you were to isolate your, your quadriceps first with uh, leg extensions and then go into squats afterwards, you'd find that your legs uh, or your quads are giving way first before the lower back because they've been pre-exhausted by the previous isolation exercise. So that's the, the, the principle behind that. Another principle you should use in your training is the Weeder Staggered Set Principle. That is, taking a minor muscle group, working in it with a major muscle group, such as training the calves with the chest. Say you're doing chest, you do bench presses. You do a set of bench presses, immediately after that set, stand up, do a set of standing calf raises. Again, go back to the chest area again, doing the bench presses. Then do the calf raises once again. This, in turn, works that calf muscle more than just, say, working it on one separate day during the week. You do the calves because you know the calves is a dense, dense muscle tissue. Along with the calves, you say, do the forearms and the trapezius muscles also, because those are very hard muscles to grow, hard muscles to work. So you would incorporate different exercises on different days. Yeah, I use the, the rest pause principle uh, in order for my body to adapt to using heavier weights. Uh, what I do, I take a basic exercise, 
Um, you know, like a heavy pressing exercise or something like that, for instance, bench press. And I'll get a weight that I can only manage maybe two or three reps with the weight. Uh, I'll do two or three reps and I'll put the weight back, I'll put it down, and I'll rest maybe 15 to 20 seconds, something like that. And I'll take the weight again and I'll do another rep. I put the weight back, I rest maybe 20, 30 seconds again, and do another rep. And that way, I'm doing a set of, uh, you know, five or six reps um, with a weight that I'm not used to, um, but I'm breaking it down. Uh, and that way, you know, get used to handling the heavy weights, and uh, it's, it's a different uh, kind of overload. Again, you know, to shock the body, to make it accommodate, instead of doing the same thing uh, all the time. There's more to muscle development than fiber size. Muscle mass is also a matter of mitochondrial mass, capillary development, and glycogen storage. Heavy, low rep training hypertrophies fibers, but higher rep endurance type training is what bodybuilders use to develop these other components of muscle size. And including both types of workouts in your bodybuilding program is called holistic training. The concept behind pyramiding, the pyramiding principle, is the idea of beginning a, with a warm-up set on a particular exercise, taking one exercise, starting at a, at a lighter level to warm the muscle up, and then progressively building the amount of weight, one set after the next, up to the top. So in other words, it's sort of, if you think of it as a triangle, you're beginning at the, down here, at the warm-up set, the next set is sort of up higher in weight, the next set is up higher and up higher until you get to the top. And then if you want to do a full pyramid, you go back the opposite way. You lower the weight, lower it a little more, lower it a little more. Ideally, the best way to train a muscle is along a direct line, starting at the point of origin and going to the point of insertion. Not all muscles can be trained this way, however. Some muscles absolutely have to be trained from different angles. Take the legs and the back, for instance. They aren't one muscle group each, but are composed of several different muscles, all working in cooperation, and each having a slightly different function. Doing leg presses with your feet out front or toes out to the side changes which leg muscles are primarily involved in the movement. Doing wide grip or close grip rowing exercises likewise involves different back muscles to a greater or lesser degree. The pectoral muscles have a single point of attachment under the delts, but multiple points of origin. So it's necessary to do flat incline and decline exercises to achieve full pectoral development. When you train the upper back, different movements involve the lats, rhomboids, the traps, and the rear delts to differing degrees, so a great many different exercises are needed to work on each of those areas fully. Some muscle groups are much simpler, such as triceps and biceps. Bodybuilders do a variety of different exercises for these muscles, but the reasoning here is less to achieve a fuller development than it is to confuse the muscles, make them do unfamiliar movements to achieve a greater intensity of response. Supersets are when you train two exercises in a row without rest. Trisets are when you train three exercises in a row without rest. Giant sets are more than three exercises in a row without rest. Their advantages to training this way is that you can increase the intensity without increasing the duration or the weight. And uh, say you're doing a superset, you want to combine like uh, for one muscle group you do uh, say flies and bench press together. You uh, overtax the muscle without doing a, an extra amount of weight by doing two movements for one muscle group. If you wanted to train uh, a superset for two muscle groups, you might want to do like uh, a, a barbell curl and a tricep push down. You can increase the intensity again without increasing the weight or the duration. I love supersetting, especially pre-contest. It's fast, you know, it's, uh, it's intense. And what happens is, is it's a different way of, uh, instead of giving the body rest, you move between two exercises. Let's say, for example, if you're doing um, 
uh, curls for the biceps. You might do straight bar curls and then immediately when you're done with the straight bar curl, you'll pick up the dumbbells and then go and do 10 repetitions with the dumbbells. But you have to make sure that the weight is something that you can control, still having good form and being able to do somewhere between 10 and 12 repetitions per exercise. It's great, it's a great principle. Supersets I do use right before competition, probably the four weeks before a contest. And I'm doing that constantly the four weeks, supersetting opposing body parts. The isotension principle creates the ultimate in muscle control. You do this by flexing the muscle when you aren't training it, posing and flexing between sets in the gym, or in posing sessions in which you flex your muscles at peak tension for three to six seconds at a time to bring out maximum definition and separation. The isotension principle, what I'm trying to get you guys to understand is that you need to flex the muscle, you need to squeeze the muscle every time after your sets, for example. If you're preparing for a competition, the same thing. You want to pump all the glycogen back into the system, okay? By flexing after each set, holding that pump, you strengthen the muscle, you harden the muscle, it gives you that fine, polished look, especially during your competition preparation period. So get that in mind. Isotension movements, it really works, and that's what you need. One of the most basic principles overall in bodybuilding training is to feel the muscle throughout the entire range of motion on the exercises and to concentrate on the feel of the muscle and not on the weight. If you're really concentrating on the feel of the muscle, you'll always know when the exercises are effective. And you'll also know when you're cheating yourself and when you're not making the exercises as effective as they can be. One of the most misunderstood aspects of bodybuilding training is how precise and controlled the exercises need to be. This takes total concentration, keeping the mind in the muscle at all times. Think about the muscle, not the weight. You should be totally aware of how the muscle feels at all times. Keeping the mind in the muscle is the philosophy behind a great many of the weeder training principles. Continuous tension, feeling the resistance throughout the entire range of motion. Peak contraction, experiencing a full contraction of the muscle at the top of each rep. Full range of motion, consciously working the muscles involved from full extension to full contraction and back again. To be effective, each bodybuilding movement should be done as precisely as any other sports technique. Bodybuilding is ultimately about muscle control, and there's no place in the gym for people who simply want to throw weights around. When you've been training as long as I have, you learn to concentrate and you learn to train for feel. You instinctively know what's right and what's wrong. Usually with beginners, this isn't the case because you haven't learned to train for feel. For a beginner, what generally feels right will be whatever kind of workout you're already used to. For example, many athletes coming to bodybuilding from other sports like to feel athletic in the gym, training too fast, too aerobically, going too much for a pump and therefore not building muscle effectively. Weightlifters and other power athletes, on the other hand, often err in the opposite direction, training too heavy and slow with too few isolation quality exercises in their training programs. If you keep your concentration and put your mind in the muscle, you'll get better and better at instinctively knowing what's best for you. However, this is not an absolute guide. Every athlete can benefit from additional coaching and guidance. Bodybuilders who are really in tune with their body should know when they're not getting the right feeling and seek additional guidance from a qualified source. But when you're doing individual muscle groups, they have to be strict. They gotta be from beginning to run total contraction and your mind has to be focused into the movement of the muscle. Bodybuilders and powerlifters get out of their workouts what they put into it. Bodybuilders don't need to be doing three, two, or one rep sets. Instead, use a variety of weeder training principles to increase the intensity of stimulus to the weaker body parts. Finally, don't overtrain weak areas. 
training longer and harder will not necessarily give you the development you need. Weak points need lots of rest and recuperation. So aim at training weak points more efficiently rather than just training them harder. Now that my champions have shown you how to use the WIDA principle, be patient. There's about 30 different principles that form the basis of the WIDA system and the basis for your success in bodybuilding. Be patient. Study them. Apply them. You are going to achieve exactly what you want through the use of these principles. In tape 10, we'll deal with the finishing touches and how to use belts, straps, and other training aids, stretching as well as warming up, the basis of sports medicine, everything you need to know to train safe and to train smart. Give yourself a year. Don't give yourself three weeks. Don't give yourself a month. Give yourself a year and find time, whether it's waking up early or coming in the gym after work. You know, you can do it. There's enough hours in the day and uh, it's all about just being dedicated. So I recommend that you get up off your butt and get in the gym. I know that I look good and I'm in shape and that um, I'm in control of the situation. And you can feel that way too. You just got to get to the gym. Whether you're 12 years old or you're 80 years old, your health is going to improve, your appearance is going to improve, you're going to feel better about yourself. If you want to look like this, you can look like this. It takes years and years and years. But I guarantee in three months, pick up some weights and you'll you'll see a definite change in your body. Don't monitor your progress based on the people you're around or the pictures you see in the magazines. Monitor your progress based on your commitment to your diet, your commitment to your working out, your intensity levels, and what you see in the mirror. There's no other exercise or anything out on the market that you can compensate and get the same look that you'll achieve in the gym by lifting weights. It just won't happen. I don't think there's any better time to do it than to do it right now. Opportunity is knocking. And procrastination is the great thief of opportunity. You can take that to the bank.